Hello everybody, welcome to today's research rundown. My name is Courtney Pinkard and I am the uh, coordinator, reference coordinator here at the Alabama Department of Archives and History. Um, I am excited to talk with you today about the Alabama Supreme Court case file digitization project. But before we get started, I do have a couple of um, announcements to make. So tomorrow uh, we will be having another Alabama radio moment. Um, it's going to be at noon tomorrow in the Farley Auditorium. And Bob Friedman will be speaking about Birmingham's Black Radio Museum. So we hope that you will join us for that. And then on Saturday, we'll be having a day long event called a celebration of black history at the Alabama archives. It's going to be a lot of fun for the whole family. So we hope that you will come down to the archives on Saturday and um, help us celebrate Black History Month. All right, so let's go ahead and get started on today's rundown topic. Um, we're going to be covering the Alabama Supreme Court case files and a segment of those um, are currently being digitized and made available online through our website. First, I'm going to give you a little bit of background um, about the scanning project, and then we'll discuss the history of the first case that was digitized. Next, we're going to briefly cover how the Supreme Court case files can be useful for researching Black Alabamians specifically. And finally, we're going to take a look at a few interesting examples from the cases that have already been digitized. All right, so the Supreme Court case file scanning project began in October of 2021. Ultimately, the project will cover over 50 years worth of cases from 1820 to 1877. These case files capture additional information that's not always available from the published court opinion on that case. This will be a multi-year and probably multi-decade project that will eventually digitize a total of 498 volumes, which will translate to thousands of individual cases placed online. As of now, we've scanned 51 out of the 498 volumes for a total of 1,200 cases uploaded so far. The digitized cases can be accessed through our digital collections page, which you can see here. There's a thumbnail labeled Supreme Court Case Files, and it's indicated on this slide by the red square. Once you click the thumbnail, you have access to search the case files using the search box that's located at the top right corner of the screen, and I've included an image of that here, or you have the option to browse all of the cases. Whether you search or browse, you'll be further um, able to sort your results by name, county, specific topic, a specific court term, or just a decade. If you want to focus in on the cases that deal with African Americans, you can use the tags African Americans or slavery. Once that tag is applied, you can further narrow down the results by a specific county. During the slavery period, most cases will be brought by or against the enslavers. Some examples include inheritance disputes, estate administrations, breach of contracts, and cases that involve debtors and creditors. Now, rarely, you will have enslaved people that appear as defendants when they've been convicted of a crime, like murder or arson. Sometimes the enslaved people are not mentioned by name at all, but usually if they are, then it's by first name only. Names and spellings were very fluid in the 19th century, so be flexible when you're searching for individuals by name. The first digitized case dealt with a family of free people of color with the surname Smith. I discovered the Smith family in 2018 while searching the U.S. Census slave schedules for an example to use in a presentation. These entries stuck out to me because they looked different from what I had seen in other slave schedules. And because it's unusual to see African Americans included in any census prior to 1870. Contrary to the instructions given by the federal authorities, the enumerator for Dallas County listed several free black families in the slave schedule, but not also in the regular population schedule as he had been directed. With my interest piqued, I started digging deeper into the background of the Smith family. I uncovered a family drama that played out over the course of roughly 25 years and eventually wound up in the Alabama Supreme Court. With the testimony contained in the Supreme Court case file, I was able to gain a better understanding of how the various family members were connected. 
Although the Smith family story was recorded in the probate records of Dallas County, the county level record was not specific enough to fill in some of the gaps that I had. Um, it was the level of detail that was contained in the testimony that was presented to the Supreme Court that helped me sort out all of the family dynamics that were at play. This slide gives a little bit more information in, about the Smith family. The patriarch of the family was a man named Tom. He was born about 1797, and he was emancipated by an act of the legislature, the state legislature, in 1829, following the death of his enslaver in 1826. Along with Tom, seven other enslaved people were freed by the act. Harriet, who was about 19 years old, Theodric, who was about 16 years old, William, who was about 15 years old, Melinda, who was about nine years old, Sarah, who was about seven, Bob, who was about 50 years old, and Charity, who was about 40 years old. The Legislative Act stated that Charity was the mother of Harriet, Theodric, William, Melinda, and Sarah. Tom died in 1850, and he left property behind that included both land and enslaved people in Dallas County. While I was going through all the documents that were included in Tom's estate file, I found a notice of judgment from the Alabama Supreme Court. The notice was dated 1854, so I searched our Supreme Court database, also on the website, for cases that were heard from Dallas County in that year. Sure enough, I found a case called Melinda and Sarah versus Garland T. Gardner and others administrator. It was in volume SC00245. The Supreme Court case file contained many transcriptions of the documents that were sent up from the lower court, meaning they were originally created by the probate court during the estate process, and then they were hand copied into um, the Supreme Court case file. This testimony helped clear up a, a number of confusing points, including the mystery of the two charities. In previous probate court documents, I saw that Tom was originally connected with the 40-year-old woman named Charity. They were both emancipated back in the late 1820s. Yet in the 1850s slave schedule where I initially encountered the Smith family, there was a freed woman named Charity Smith. and She was listed as only being 40 years old at that time. So the Charity that was emancipated in the late 1820s should have been about 61 by then. The fragmentary documents that I located at the county level simply were not detailed enough to help me understand the significance of this younger charity. Thankfully, I had the Supreme Court case file to refer to. Through testimony and other legal documents that were sent up to the higher court, I finally sorted out who was who. According to Garland T. Gardner, Tom cohabited with a um, with the first charity, and he had children um, with her. And while they were enslaved by the man named Baxter Smith, they cohabited as husband and wife. And their children that they had together were Melinda and Sarah. Now remember, this charity had some older children, um, but they were, uh, their father was not Tom. Um, so the, the children that charity number one had with Tom Smith were Melinda and Sarah. However, Charity number one and um, Tom had, they broke up, they separated. Um, and by the time Tom was emancipated, he had already moved on to his second wife, who was also named Charity. So that would be Charity number two. And in fact, he fathered the first of his children with Charity number two while he was still technically enslaved. The legal proceedings to emancipate him were in the works, but the legislative act to emancipate didn't pass until 1829, and their first son, Oregon, was born about 1827. When I pulled the court case file, I found many enlightening documents from the Dallas County Probate Court that had been transcribed word for word into the Supreme Court volume. A detailed appraisal of Tom Smith's estate was included. The very first line items in this appraisal were four enslaved people with familiar names, Charity, Organ, Miles, and Rebecca. 
Because they were still enslaved at the time that the appraisal was conducted, they were assigned a dollar value along with the rest of the enslaved people owned by Tom, as well as his livestock, farming implements, and furniture. Skipping ahead a few pages, I came to the final settlement of Tom's estate. This is where his administrator made a full account of all the debts and credits that were due to the estate, as well as showing the final distribution of the inheritance among the heirs. Tom's legal heirs were his widow, Charity, and his two older children, Melinda and Sarah, and his three younger children that he had with Charity number two, which would be Oregon, Miles, and Rebecca. And just like that, Charity and her children had gone from having the status of property to being the legal dis distributees of Tom Smith. Each of the children received a share of $1,609.88, which adjusted for inflation would be $58,000 uh, today. Charity, as Tom's widow, received a greater portion and hers would have been the equivalent of almost $73,000 today. But Tom's older daughters, Melinda and Sarah, said not so fast. They filed a petition to the probate court that not only accused Gardner of holding out on them by failing to include several sources of income for the estate in his final settlement, but they also insisted that they were the only legal heirs of Tom Smith, since Charity, Oregon, Miles, and Rebecca were still enslaved and considered part of the property of the estate when Tom died. Of course, Charity, Oregon, Miles, and Rebecca then showed up to court to insist that they were the only legal heirs of Tom's estate. This dispute is actually what brought the case up to the Supreme Court to begin with. So if this argument over the heirship hadn't occurred, I wouldn't have had such a thorough case file to help me understand what was going on. In addition to Gardner's testimony about the connections between the various Smith family members, the court documents also provided details about each of Tom's children. For instance, I discovered that Tom and Charity number two had a fourth child that died before Tom. This person was never named and it's only referenced and they're only referenced in the passage from the case file underlined on the top left image. The unnamed child left behind a five-year-old child of their own. I believe this is Priscilla, a granddaughter that Charity number two raised. And to my surprise, the case file even indicated who the Smith women had married. Melinda was married to an enslaved man named Poldo. Sarah was married to an enslaved man named Daniel. And Rebecca was married to a freed man named William Wilson. These connections helped me track down the Smiths in the 1870 and 1880 censuses. Now, before we move on, I did want to take a moment to point out that the Smith case is really more the exception than the rule as far as what you'll find in a Supreme Court case file. Due to restrictions in state law, most enslaved people who were emancipated were required to leave the state. So the population of free people of color in Alabama stayed relatively low throughout the mid 1800s. And from this already small group, only a few would have had their day in court like the Smiths had and even fewer than that would have had their case heard by the Supreme Court. All of that is to say, if you're trying to use the Supreme Court case files for genealogy research, your mileage is going to vary and you probably won't find anything nearly as informative as the Smith case, but it's still a very interesting case to take a look at. At the end of many of the digitized case files, you'll see a copy of the official reporting of the case from the Alabama Reports publication. This gives an overview of the case and the decision of the Supreme Court after hearing the case. In the Melinda and Sarah case, the Supreme Court affirmed the decision of the lower court. Based on precedent found in other similar cases, they concluded that Melinda, Sarah, Charity, Oregon, Miles, and Rebecca were all the rightful heirs of Tom's estate. Another interesting point to consider when you're using the Supreme Court case files is that they are a permanent record of cases that were initially heard in lower courts, usually Chancery, aka Circuit Court, or Probate Court, and those courts operate at the county level. 
We have lots of county level court records on microfilm in our research room, but they're primarily focused on the probate court cases. And on most genealogy sites, you're also going to find the same focus on probate court because that's usually where you'll find the record types with genealogical information like a marriage license or a copy of a will. The way I think of probate court is that it's more a court of record. It's where you go to record that something happened, like this marriage was solemnized on this date or this parcel of land was sold to this person. You want to keep those kinds of records forever. On the other hand, circuit court cases are more about seeking equity, like one party is coming to the court um, to seek some kind of resolution against another party in a dispute. Some courthouses hold on to their circuit court cases for a long time, but many will eventually clear out the old cases to make room for storing more recent ones. And legally, that's not a big deal because once the case gets decided and the equity between the two parties is reached, that's the end of it as far as the law is concerned. Point being, circuit court cases that were appealed to the Supreme Court have now passed into the permanent record at the state level. So many of these cases that were once documented at the county courthouse now only survive in our facility. And if you're doing genealogy research in a county that has had extensive document loss due to fire or other disaster, you may want to check our Supreme Court case file index to see if any of the cases might mention your ancestor. It may not give you much genealogical information, but it will at least place your ancestor in that geographic place and at a specific time. Here are some examples of the types of circuit court cases that might be centered around enslaved people. A dispute between a married couple over a separate use agreement. Separate use agreements were usually contracted before marriage, but not always, and the Reader's Digest version is that the enslaved people were designated for the separate use of the wife, and if the husband were to get into trouble financially, the wife's slaves couldn't be repossessed by the creditors to satisfy the husband's debts. Sometimes he might be given permission to manage the enslaved people on his wife's behalf, but it was with the understanding that it was still going to be for her financial benefit. Unless, of course, the husband ignores the separate use stipulations and sells or hires out the wife's enslaved persons for his own financial benefit. So that's usually what's going to be going on in those types of cases. You might also see cases of one enslaver suing another for damages if an enslaved person that was sold as being sound was found to be otherwise, so a fraudulent sale. Sometimes you'll find inheritance cases coming up from chancery court or circuit court instead of the probate court. It really is going to depend on which lower court made a decision that the appellants took issue with. In the Smith case, it was the probate court's decision on who the heirs of the estate were, more so than one party seeking damages from the other party. So that's why it was, it was in the probate court. But if, let's say, the heirs wanted to sue the administrator to recover property or money, that would fall more under the umbrella of circuit court. And lastly, the circuit court would hear criminal cases. So every now and then we'll see an appeal on behalf of an enslaved person that had been convicted of a crime like murder or arson. Those instances are quite rare though. For example, out of the 1200 cases we have scanned so far, only six are tagged both slavery and homicide. So now let's take a look at some interesting cases. In this 1848 case where David F. Adams was accused of stealing two enslaved men from their owner and Mrs. Sarah A. Austin, we are told that the enslaved men actually went by two different names. If you've been researching African American ancestors in the early 1900s and 1800s, you've probably already figured out that names were very fluid for quite some time after slavery ended. In this case, we've got Richard, alias Ben, and Robert, alias Allen. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was looking for someone named Robert and I was trying to think of alternate names to search, I would probably try Bob or Bobby or Rob, but I would have never thought to look for someone going by the name Allen. I'm not really sure what's going on with this case. Um, maybe when they were stolen, the thief sold them under new names to kind of 
throw the authorities off the trail, maybe. Um, maybe they've had multiple owners and one of their owners decided to call them by a different name, but they still use the old name sometimes. I just really don't know. There wasn't enough detail um, in the Supreme Court case filed to help me understand why they had these aliases. Um, but e either way, it's a good, good way to point out that this is an example of how difficult it can be to track someone in the historical record if their name is in flux. On this next slide, we will see another familiar name. This is the 1859 case of Foster v. Holly. Holly sued the owners of the schooner Clotilda for damages when the Clotilda hit a skiff that was anchored in Mobile Bay and Alfred, an enslaved man, was killed. This incident occurred about six months before the Clotilda sailed to Africa to pick up the last cargo of enslaved people known to be imported into the U.S. This case was actually sent up from the city court of Mobile, so yet another type of court where the original case file might not exist today, but because it was appealed, we have it permanently preserved at the archives. And just as a side note, the judgment of the lower court was reversed in this case, like in the Smith case, it was affirmed, but in this case, it was reversed and it was remanded back to Mobile for a retrial. And finally, we have this 1846 case that is related to the inheritance of the children of Jeremiah Smith, not related to the previous Smith family. Totally different Smiths, different county altogether. Um, when Smith died, he owned 41 enslaved people and his will directed the court to divide his property, his property equally among his heirs. The enslaved people were separated into lots of roughly equal value, and then the heirs drew for the lots. These entries are notable because they list the age of each enslaved person, and that information is not always provided. It's a little bit uncommon to see each individual person's age listed. Um, there's even a baby that is um, one and a half years old in this in these lists, um, and we don't always get that level of specificity um, when we're dealing with estate documents. Documentation like this could be valuable for researching enslaved ancestors because it establishes a chain of custody from one generation of the white slave owning family down to the next generation. And it would help you understand when the slaves that belong to a single individual were distributed, who did they go to, which, how were they broken up among the many heirs um, of one person. Okay, so that's it for my slides. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in today. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, so we can take some questions if anybody has some. All right, let's see. Okay, all righty. So does anybody have any questions? You can um, you can put questions in the in the comments um, on Facebook. You can comment, or on YouTube you can comment, and um, we'll see what questions we get. I must have done a really good job of explaining. Nobody has any any questions. <laughs> I'll give some time for typing. <laughs> Okay, well, hearing no questions, um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up for the day. But again, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, if you have, if you think of any questions that you have about um, our Supreme Court case files, uh, again, you can find them when they're digitized and uploaded. You can find them online on our digital collections. And if you come across anything interesting, have any questions, feel free to email me and I will do my best to answer your questions on the cases. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye.